I bring you a simple message again today. And I've titled it Intentional Seed. Intentional Seed. That's what I want to teach. Um, as I was putting final touches, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, I realized that it's a message that may take four, it may be a four part series. But I've given myself only two Sundays. I may come back in May. By the way, May is when I'm hoping that we can go back to our wealth empowerment. But I'm going to start in any event today and next week and then see how far it goes. But um, social media or some Christians or some people have biased our mind or corrupted, corrupted our mind so much that when we hear the word seed, it's a signal that the pastor wants to take your money. We naturally switch off, saying, no, oh, they've come again. Pastor now wants to buy a new car, a new suit, wants to buy a new house, is interested in stock, they want to do also. So you naturally switch off because you think the pastor wants to patronize or summonize you about money again. But when you thoroughly investigate every teaching of the seed, you will know if you are, if you are someone who operates in the depth of spirituality, you will know that when we talk of seed, money is the least. And you will see it when I start teaching about it. Money is the least of the seed that you have. In fact, money is the last of the seed. The physical seed is different from the spiritual seed. But they operate in the same way as you will see by this teaching. And I said, understanding the mystery of the seed in your hand is the solution to fruitfulness in your life. The seed in your hand is the ultimate solution of fruitfulness or to fruitfulness in your life. A seedless life, i.e., a life that does not contain a seed is a moribund life, a dormant life, a life that is full of dryness. I pray that that will not be your portion. You know, and the reason why I said money is the last is because money is not the only seed you can plant. In fact, Having money may be the result of a seed, a non-monetary seed that you have planted, and money is the harvest. So I will encourage you not to switch off from this message. I don't want a new suit. I have too many. I don't want a new car. I just bought another one. I don't want a new house. I have houses. I want to understand the essence of life. And if you are able to grasp the essence of this life, you will be amazed how colorful your life will be. So don't, don't switch off. It's a simple teaching. What then is a seed? What then is a seed? Uh, I was checking a dictionary yesterday and I saw that the dictionary defines seed as the fertilized, matured oval of a flowering plant containing an embryo or rudimentary plant. So within a seed, there's a potential for fertilization. There's an oval within it. There's an embryo or a rudimentary plant based within a seed. Perhaps that may be a bit too difficult to comprehend 
And I've defined a seed, any seed, to be anything that has a potential for growth and is planted. Anything that you do that has a potential. That is why it says in the English man's dictionary that it must have an embryo within it. The potential for growth. And it must be planted. And when we say it must be planted, it does not have to be planted only in the soil. It could be something that you give as a service. It could be something as you give as a gift. It could be something as you give as money. In fact, the fundamentals of seeding are three basic things, all starting with T, T for tile. <laughs> There's a time that you can give. There's a talent that you can give. And there's a treasure that you can give. The treasure there is your money, your value, and all sorts of things. The talent there is your gift. And the time there is your service. I'll say it again. The treasure, which is the last one, is the money that you can give, the value that you can give. The talent is your gift, your skill that you can give. And time is the, the sacrifice that you put into something without necessarily expecting anything. Our workers who come in even during COVID will fall within that kind of seeding. They are giving their time. Workers that come in very early to make sure that everything is ready for the service. Whilst others are sleeping at home, they are giving their time. Not money, but they're giving their time. Those who work either in a sectoriate or on the stage, and the people who sing, the people who collate our sectoriate, those who do our workers in training and so on and so forth, they're giving their skill. Those who teach um, people on the project management and all those things, they're giving their skill. They are not being paid by the church, but it's a service that they're giving. It's a seed. And of course, the last one is the treasure. Our tithing, our offering, our redemption of our vows and pledges. And the things that we do, that we should really receive money, but we're saying we don't want money. Those are our values. And those are the basic fundamentals of every seed that you give. And until you understand those three fundamentals, your mind will always say, when they say, come and seed, or a seeding is required in the church, the first thing that comes to your mind is money. And thank God for the prayers that, come in this, that came in this morning. And some people will be coming from home and their mind is already switched off because of the title of the message. If you are switched off because of the title, you will be tied to less. If you are not interested in the message, you will find yourself in a mess. And I pray that that will not be your portion. In creation, God himself started a sequence of seeding. In a such a wonderful manner, and I will take through some scriptures in Genesis that I'm teaching, so we will express some scriptures. Genesis 1, if you look at Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, let's, let's go there. Let's, let's work it out together. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says in the beginning God created. That creation was a form of seeding. Created the heavens and the earth. And verse 2 says the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, if a farmer goes out of you, go somewhere, and if you're going to be offering your time, it means that place needed time. And without time, there is voidness. If you go somewhere and they require your talents, it means there's a solution, that there's a problem that needs to be solved. 
and your talent is required. Without your talent, that place is going to be void. And if you go somewhere and they require your treasure, your money, your value that you need to add to anything, it means that thing is thirsting or hungry for your money. And it's a sequence that God himself organized or initiated. And if you look at all the things that God did, he did light, he did this, he did permanence, he said this will be heaven, this will be earth, and so on and so forth. Those things, God started them before he got to verse 29. Let's see what is in verse 29. Verse 29 says, and God said, see, all those things that he had made, starting from the creation of light, because without light, you can't see what to plant. <laughs> Everywhere will be dark. Without light, a seed planted cannot germinate. Have you, those who give flowers, you know, if they give you flower, they put um, something at the base with water and a little bit of seed or food for the plant. If you use the water, you use the seed, and you don't put it up in a vase and put it by the window, it will wither. So God had to bring light into darkness of this world ready for seeding season. And so God had created, if you look at 20, let's start from 27, let me show you something. So, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the, of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Man was created in verse 20, 28, verse 27. And in verse 28, he told them what they needed to do. The number one thing that they needed to do was to be fruitful. In 29, the Bible says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields what? See which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree that, every tree whose fruit yields what seed to you, it shall be for food. Without 29, 27, 28 will be nothing. If man is created and he does not have the revelation of seed, the man will die of hunger. So God himself knew this, so he created man and opened their eyes to see it. Are you following me? He opened their eyes to where seed is based. That is why he said to them, see. There is a need for you to see before you can find. Those who are blind don't find unless they are led. I'm not talking of physical blindness alone. I'm talking of spiritual blindness. And that's why Jesus said some people, they see, but they can't see. They, can't, they, they, they have eyes, but they don't see. So, it's very important that you bear this in mind. The sequence that God himself used in creating the heavens and the earth followed a seeding and a harvest in time. So, if you get, we go back to the three T's again, you are going to need to see for you to know the time that you need to give in. You, are need, to, you need to be able to see for you to be able to give your talent. You need to be able to see to be able to get your treasure in. And it's always a spiritual and physical law. The law of gravity. It's a physical law of gravity, isn't it? Um, whatever goes up must come down. It's a law of physics, isn't it? Is it Albert Einstein that, that gave us that law of gravity for the scientist? I was an art student, so I don't know much of chemistry. It's always zero. That's cool. Newton, Isaac Newton, thank you, Isaac Newton. Albert Einstein is the other one. Isaac Newton gave us that law of gravity. What goes up will do what? Will come down. Is the law of gravity. 
no matter how good you are as a prayer warrior, as I'm standing here, you cannot pray that I will just go up. You can't. I'm standing on solid ground. There's no velocity in me that can make me go up and never come down. If I go up there on the gallery, if I jump, I will fall and wound myself. No matter how much I pray. What goes up must come down. If I go to the top of the BT Towers or Empire State Building and I say I'm so great an apostle or a miracle worker and I jump, <laughs> we've been to Empire State Building and you will see how tall it is. So if you jump, you are landing and you are landing badly. It's a physical law of gravity that will come to pass as many times as you try it. But there's a spiritual law also, which um, I think uh, Pastor Ronke um, prayed with. Galatians 6. Let's look at Galatians 6, 7 to 10. Galatians 6, 7 to 10. It's, we're all very familiar with it, so I just want us to, to read it. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man, repeat it, souls. Say it again. Souls. This is the word of God. He said, do not be deceived. Another scripture says, God cannot be deceived. God is not mocked. It will be a mockery to spiritual law as embedded in the Bible if a man sows and does not receive a return. So whatever a man sows, that if we also Reap. Verse 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, let someone say due season, say it again, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. The problem that we have, especially with spiritual seeding. I call it seeding, just planting as someone would say, but I love to say seeding. Is that many times we have sold but we are not seeing the return quickly. And the return will forever come. It will come whether we like it or not. That return always, always comes. So I'm saying to you, whether you have sown 10 years ago, either in time or in talent or in treasure, you will soon receive your harvest. If you look at Mark 4, 26 to 29, Mark 4, 26 to 29. Let's look at it in the New Living Translation. Mark 4, 26 to 20. This was also said. The kingdom of God. Now, what does it say? Kingdom of God. This it means in God's kingdom. In God. Now, I make bold to tell you that everything that's on this earth, everything that is in heaven, is about seed time and harvest time. Everything. The clothes you are wearing. Someone planted a cotton for you to be able to wear it. The coffee table in our offices, the chairs, someone brought them from a seed that was planted that became an oak tree and someone made them into what you have. The person that I am, I was a result of a seeding that was planted and then delivered. And of course, God keeping my life, I will go back to where? To soil. Hallelujah. So, the kingdom of God, which is the highest of all the kingdoms, is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Let someone say scatter seed. Verse 27. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. It takes time. But he does not understand how it happens. 
So if you have given either time, talent, or treasure, and you are not receiving it yet, do not grow weary. Because it takes time for the seed to sprout. It takes time for the seed to grow. Verse 28. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf of a leaf blade pushes through. Then the heads of wheat are formed. And finally, the grain ripens. The grain ripens. Immediately, you put in the sickle because the harvest has come. Look at it from the time it planted to the time it got the harvest. It's a spiritual law. In Genesis 8.22, Genesis 8.22, God brought in this principle that has never failed and will never fail. It says, whilst the earth remains, Genesis 8.22, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night. And the last one there is very important. Last sentence, it said, shall not cease. It means it doesn't matter whether you're a Muslim, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a Hinduist, whether, what, whether you're an atheist, whether you are whatever you are, agnostic, there will always be seed time and there will always be harvest time. There will always be cold and there will always be heat. There will always be winter and there will always be summer. And there will always be day and there will always be night and they shall not stop until Jesus comes. Hallelujah. So, a seed on its own is ineffective without a suitable weather. A seed is what? Ineffective without a suitable weather. You need the right amount of sun, the right amount of water, the right amount of rain, and the right suitable land for it to go into fruit. I'm taking my time to teach this because it's important that you understand the fundamentals. In Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2, Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord and his fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established upon the waters. That's what God did in Genesis 1, 1 to 31. And the reason why you shouldn't hold close too much to your seed, which again I say could be time, could be talent, or could be treasure, is because God has the monopoly of the land and of the sun and of the rain. You recall that rich man who had a bountiful harvest and was saying to everybody, see, I've made this, I've made that. Let us now drink and be merry for tomorrow. Should I? And God said, tonight, I'm calling you forth. So it's very important that we know that no matter how big your seed is, no matter how big your time is, no matter how big or precious your talent is, no matter how precious your treasure is, you require the sun and the land and the rain, which you do not have, which are controlled by God. You can plant your seed today and God may say, no rain, no sun. And people in some parts of Africa are suffering farming. They have the seed to plant, but they don't have the land. Neither do they have the sun. Or the sun is too extreme. Or the rain is too much. So the sun and the land belong to God. Only the seed is what you have control in. And you cannot eat your seed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul said, I planted, Apollo watered, but God gave the increase. Take God away from the seeding formula, you will have a dry land. Take God away from the seeding formula, you will have a dry, moribund, moribund and dry life. 
So if God therefore, Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, it is God that gives us power to make wealth. If God's power is therefore removed, your wealth is nothing. That is why the question of seed, the question of seed time and harvest time is so important in every Christian's life. In anyone's life, that's why all the religions of this world, they always talk about giving, about giving, about giving, about giving. And the giving, like I said, is not restricted to your treasure. It's inclusive of your time and your talent. And what you can say is that, oh, I've given my time. I don't need to give my talent. Neither can you say, I've given my talent. I don't need to give my treasure. You have to give all the three. As you have opportunity, that's what we read in Galatians 6. Are you following me? Are you following me? I don't want you to sleep. I want you to follow me carefully because from the beginning of this year that God said, we will have a complete victory. What God has been teaching us month by month by month are secrets to success. And one of it is what I'm teaching you. If God had not opened your eyes to where your seed is, or if God has not opened your eyes to where your seed is, your life will remain moribund. And that is why some people, they will be around fellowshipping with us, um, clapping hands with us, sharing all sorts of things. The same message that we had is what they had. The same wealth empowerment messages that we've had is what they've had. But they will continue to be poor as some people are becoming richer. They need to investigate why. I hope I'll be able to show you by the time I finish this series. The same message. The same theories. The same practicalities. The same anointing. But there are secrets that you need to discover. Your eyes must be open to where your seed is. Or else, it will be an uncolorful life. I pray that will not be your portion. So, like I said earlier, God created what bears seed and set the world in motion of procreation and population. He created it, 27 verse 27, Genesis 1 verse um, 27, then 29 revealed where the seed is. He says, see the seed. If I say to you what I'm about to say, you may be surprised. And I have said it emphatically. God is no longer in the business of creating anything new anymore. He's finished. He's done it. And some people may say, but he said he will make everything. Isaiah 43, isn't it? He said he will make everything new. No, 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 no. Those things are already there. He's just opening your eyes to the revelation of the newness of those things. And that person may say to me, oh, no, he said, he will make a way that seems no way. No, the way is already there. You are just coming to the revelation of where the way is. Some people are going to Mass and say, ah, oh, wow, this is new. No, God had already been to Mass even before you arrived. He's just giving you the wisdom. Someone said, oh, but someone shared testimony that they didn't have womb and they had a baby. And they, No, 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 it's not that God is making a new thing. It's just that that's Revelation, that miracle is just becoming afresh to you so that you, you see it, you just see it. Oh, this is a new thing. It's already been done. God is not going to make anything new again. Nothing new. So, because of the limitation of our own powers, we can pray, God, give me a new organ. God, give me a new this. God, give me a new kidney. God is not going to design a new kidney. No, he's not going to do that anymore. It will make the old or the sickly or the unhealthy kidney that you have to become new. You've just come to the attainment of that revelation. God gave the doctors, the medical experts, the ability to do kidney transplant, pancreas transplant, liver transplant, because of the wisdom they are implanted in their own mind. It's a discovery. What they are discovering is already there. They are just discovering it. It's just like treasures in dark places or treasures in hidden places. They are hidden to us, but God already put them there. We are just discovering. That is why it's important that 
don't just be an ordinary Christian. Don't just be a historical Christian. Don't just be a Christian that reads his Bible just like a history book. This is how uh, Mongo Park discovered a place, a, a source of um, river in Africa. No, don't, don't be a Christian like that. Be a Christian that sees hidden secrets that are embedded in the Bible. In 2 Peter 1, 3 to 5. In fact, let's read 2 Peter 1, 3 to 8. Because it's a teaching class. So I want you to just follow. Follow this carefully. And you will see why I'm saying what I've been saying. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, without that knowledge, you can scream from morning to night that you have a divine nature of God without having it. It's the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly. Say exceedingly. Say it again. Great and precious promises that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature. Without you having that knowledge of the precious promises, you cannot partake in it. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith, add, um, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, all these things that you must follow. Verse 6, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness. Verse 7, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness what? Love. Those are all the seeds that you are planting for you to come into the realization of that knowledge. For you to have the divine nature. To understand what God has given you for life and for godliness. Verse 8 is where I'm going. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor what? Unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Putting it simply, what Peter is saying is that God has given you everything for life and godliness, but you need to have all those things and abound in them or else you'll be barren and unfruitful. May that not be your portion. So I want us to read that verse 8 together. One, two, three, go. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist says in Psalm 82, 6, Psalm 82, 6, that I like to quote a lot, he said, you are God, and all of you are children of the Most High. You are God. God is not going to start again. He has given you that power that resides in you. Ephesians 3.20 tells us, Ephesians 3.20 tells us that he is able to, get, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can ask all things through the power that resides in you or power that works in you. So you see that you have everything that you require but there is a hidden power, a hidden seed in you that must be planted by the secret in the knowledge of God. The seed is always inside the fruit or the tree. And unless you discover it, the tree is just there. You looking at it without you getting a grasp of what is embedded in it. It's a natural sequence for every tree and every animal, for every plant, and every man or woman, there's a seed in you. And God said, I will create all these things so that you can grasp the seed and then they begin to bear the like of those trees. It happens in the physical, it happens in the spiritual. And when God wanted to save the world, what did he do? He gave his own son as a seed. Jesus had to come as a seed despite his immaculate conception. The conception may be immaculate, 
but the developmental process, the biological process of a child bearing must happen. A seed of the Holy Ghost must be planted into the womb of Mary. And it must be nine months and then delivery. This seed was planted in Mary's womb. And Mary became pregnant. And thank God for the Bible. The Bible says, when Mary, when, uh, Mary took his, her pregnancy to visit her cousin Elizabeth that was six months earlier, the baby inside Elizabeth jumped, reacting to the seed that is already growing. And I say, if a seed, a good seed, a fervent seed is inside you, when you meet someone that has a fertilized soil, you will know. That's why it's not everybody that's my friend anymore. Because there are certain places that if I go, it will be like wasting my seed. Or if I'm the one carrying the fertilized soil, if I go, no matter how much seed you put in me, my soil will not react to yours. That is why some people, no matter how much you try, they are going to different diverse ways. They cannot just work with each other because your seed must cooperate with my soil for it to flourish. You know, in Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15 it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and our seed. Our seed is capital S. And it shall bruise your head and shall bruise his heel. You see that battle. It's going to be the battle of survival for the seed. So that is why light and darkness cannot be friends. That is why the corrupt seed must never be placed with a, with a clean or a nice seed. That is why a bad apple must never be placed beside a good apple. You know, we, we have, I have that experience at home. When we buy a lot of fruit and we put them in a basket, if we don't eat them quick enough and one starts to get spoiled, the other good ones beside it are also on their way to damage. It's the same thing with human beings. You must have sense. You must teach your children enough sense, as we had recently, to understand bad apples, bad mangoes, good seed, and bad seed. At times when I pray, the picture I see are people who have sweated and sweated and sweated and sweated on the work and they are not getting any harvest. It's because all that sweat have been planted on the bad soil. May that not be your portion. That is why you see some people when they just you just, you just see the sparkle together. You just see life. You, just, you start a friendship with them. You just see life. You're always happy. It doesn't matter whether they are perfect or imperfect in some areas. You just see that you precept upon precept, line upon line, iron, sharpness, iron. If you're an iron and you go and attempt to sharpen a wood, you will be there for long. I think it's in Exodus 10. That says an axe must be sharp, or else you will neighbor more. Thank you, sir. That is why, in my 22 years, I think 22 years now, that I've been a pastor, I've seen that there are certain set of people that you just need to tell them something, just throw a seed, and they will run with it. And those are the people that flourish. There are people that make money, they are wealthy. You know, someone was saying to me, Oh, Pastor, you like you like moving, and they say this to many pastors also. You, 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 pastors, you like moving with wealthy people. I say, that is a terrible error. It's a wicked error. 
and it can only come from an ignorant mind proceeding out of a reckless mouth brittle with a bad tongue I said no pastors don't move well I as a pastor I don't move with wealthy people wealthy people must move with me for them to remain wealthy they have to they have to you have to move with me you have to like me you have to sow in me you have to like my ministry you have to remain in my church for you to prosper i don't need to go and search you all over the place no no he can't work with me the anointing that i carry is too bright for darkness to associate with it and said, go and check out my church people have been in my church 15 years 20 years 10 years and those who have left, they are still my friends. They still want to be with me. That's carrying the anointing of light. A soil that is fertile. A seed that is potent and powerful. So if you follow, and I've said it this year, it's a year of complete victory. If you follow what we've been teaching, We've thought about evangelism, winning souls. We've thought about faith. We've thought about prayer. We've thought about wealth. We are talking about seeding. If you follow those things, you are not just hearers of the word, lying on your bed and sipping coffee. If you go out and practicalize what we are teaching, you cannot be poor. You cannot be bad. You cannot be foolish. You will prosper. You will increase. You will enlarge. And you begin to be a blessing to others. That is why when I was teaching the introduction to multiple streams of income, I added one that many of the authorities in this world that teach the streams of income don't add. I said there is a seed income. You remember? There's a seed income. But the seed income takes time to come. So I think I was teaching during a love court session that God gave me that revelation and I said look I have a seed income apart from the fact that I have all the other streams, all, not one is missing, I also have a seed income so my wife brings fruit to me that's a seed, I'm not talking of fruit of uh, just uh, anything, solid fruit I've told you there was a time we bought it property in the U.S. It was my wife that put the money at $65,000. That's a seed income to me. I don't have to lift a heavy thing for it to be secured. As she does to me, I do to her. That's seed income. My children have to give me. They give me uh, recently, one of them just said, Daddy, check your account. I checked my account. I found the money. Say said, that's for your fuel for the week. Seed income. If she has not given me I will have to go and use part of my money to pay for it. Seed income. I have people who give me. We are not talking of honorarium to just honor me. A monthly regular seed that must land in my account every month. Seed income. It's also taxable, but it's seed income. And this is what we are talking about. Is a battle of the seed and the soil. If you don't get it right, you will be wrong. It's always going to be a battle. In 1 Peter 5 8, 1 Peter 5 8, he said, Be sober, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom it may devour. Don't let the lion devour your seed. If you don't give it, someone will come and take it. Even when you have planted, someone is looking to uproot. Exactly, say there's a time to plant and there's time to pluck. It does not mean that the person that has planted is the one that will pluck. Thank God for Jesus. First John 3 8. First John 3 8 said, and Jesus also was made to manifest. The Son of Man was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. So it's not everybody that you can have men 
getting themselves together and say, we must be giving this person money. Every We are not talking of one year. We are not talking of two years. We are not talking of three years. We are not talking of four years. We are not talking of five years. We are not talking of six years consistently every month. And there's someone else that has been giving for almost about 10 years. Every month. Seed. So, some people, they've never given tithes. And they'll be giving what we call shekele offering. You will receive shekele harvest. They've never given offering even. And they come to church. They enjoy the worms. They enjoy the prayers. They enjoy everything. But they don't give. Because they don't think it's important. I'm opening your eyes to something important today. Because when the time came for God to create the world, he used seed and harvest. When he came to save the world, he used his only begotten son. Brothers and sisters, if there's a message that you need to learn, when I was growing as a Christian, the only thing I was interested in is seed time and harvest time. And thank God, I thought I was being selfish. I understood, I learned to understand the rudimentary philosophy of seed and harvest. That's not, it's not surprising for me that I can add seed income as part of my streams of income. Because I gave and I'm still giving. I love to give money to people. I may not have given you because you already have. <laughs> the people I give money to, my disciples, and I give thousands at a time, at a single giving. And I'm not boasting a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, three thousand pounds, five thousand pounds to one individual, just like that. So it's not surprising that the harvest is coming back now. So it's not something you jump up from the church now and say, ah, God, give me seed income too, like the pastor. It's hard work. Let me end with this before we go to communion. Like I said, I've been a pastor for 22 years now. I became a pastor in 1990, 1998, 1996, we started to 1998. And I worked for the church for the first 12 years of this church. Our most prosperous. I never took a penny from the church. Our treasurer, I said, they begged me, they asked for it. I said, no, no, there's no need. But now, and they just sat in my house, I used my money, I use everything. But now, see, God is favoring me on our side. I give my time. I was, I became the church lawyer in 1998. 1998. I did a lot of work for the church. I'm talking of the whole new covenant church. Never receive, I will do the work. I will not receive a single penny. I did the work in my farm. I did the work. <laughs> so it's not surprising about two years ago they said they wanted to register all the branches of the New Covenant Church. Of course, they came to me and said, We are going to pay you. So every church that I registered paid me money. That is the harvest to a seed of time. Do we want to talk about treasure? We can't even begin to talk, talk about treasure that the Lord has used by the grace of God. So, next week, I will tell you types of seed and how to apply them because there must be an intention without wicked motive to every seed that you plant. Let's rise up. Have we served the communion? First Corinthians eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven. I'm reading from verse twenty three. This is Paul instituting the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians eleven from twenty three. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread.
of bread is on top. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the bread there. Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. I want you, as you partake in the bread, I want you to just believe that as you eat of this bread, you are actually eating the body of Christ. That body was broken so that your own bodies will be whole. And Jesus wants us to do it in remembrance. He wants us to do it almost every day if we can. Husband and wife, doing it every day, doing it specially every week, doing it every month. In church, do it. And as you partake in it, I pray that every broken part of your body, in health, in blood, in water, in muscle, in bone, will receive the healing that was achieved on the cross. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink. As often as you drink it, the remembrance of me. As you bless the wine which represents Jesus' blood, I pray that you're partaking of it today. Represent blood of Jesus in your body. Go to every part of you and you will receive your healing. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we thank you. We appreciate you for the sacrifice that your seed represented on the cross. You are no more nailed to the cross. But as we remember you every so often with the breaking of bread and the partaking in the wine, we accomplish in our bodies what your son accomplished on the cross. And we thank you because we know that it's a typical example of the manifestation of seeding and harvesting. One life, the life of Christ, has now affected over 2.5 billion Christians. So we give ourselves to you for use in time, in talent, and in treasure. Pray that this message that we've preached we will be seen with the right attitude and we will run with the underlying message so that the seed that we have will go ahead and be planted so that it can bring much more fruit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let this week be a week of fertilization of seed and of harvest. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.